Artemis Queen Mary is a frightened ship. And she carries with her a premonition. Why? Of death. Imagine taking a tour of the Queen Mary. Not as it is now, but as it was in 1938. And the stranger stories. Ghost stories? You want to call him the haunted tour? I can't leave my son alone here. Stay with me. Forever. David Ratch, traveling third class with his family. Here's Mr. Ratch lost his senses sometime after dinner. Captain, there's been a murder. What did you do to my husband? He's with the ship now. Happy Halloween! Famous for our fiction, sometimes facts can be much stranger. Thank you for having me. Uh, I uh, kind of started off this crazy journey into becoming a producer, uh, working in theme parks and starting off at the Disneyland Resort, where I I worked on Fantasmic um, and uh, driving floats. So you can't. Uh, you can't fault an 18 year old going and saying, Hey, would you like to drive a float, you know, at a Disneyland parade or on water, you know, and they give you the keys. And, and I, since that point, you know, I've been enamored with entertainment. So, uh, I started off there, started working a little bit with theme park design and then moved over to producing. So we started working on the early versions of the Harry Potter theme park, um, actually going to be built in the UK. And then we, um, unfortunately, uh, the people financing, uh, thought it wouldn't have the, uh, the 10 year, 20 year, uh, um, term of being able to last through, you know, all these different Harry Potter movies. So they canceled it and then universal body buying our designs or bought our designs. And then, uh, from there we went over to comedy, which was a completely change of a venue for us. And I wrote some comedy for Jay Leno for, you know, for a year or so and to sitcoms, with uh andy ackerman who was the director for seinfeld for many many years and then from there i decided to get into the haunted house space because it just always fascinated me um and all those paranormal shows were getting very popular where people were going out with most haunted and and investigating various locations so i said you know i went to santa clara university and right across the street was the winchester mystery house so it just made sense to go and explore the Winchester house and whether or not anyone had made a movie about this location. And sure enough, no one had. And the owners of the house were actually Santa Clara university graduates. So I got the rights to that and then moved from there to go to get the rights to the queen Mary. And I always would look around Halloween and time magazine would always put out most haunted locations in the United States or the world. And queen Mary and Winchester were always in the top five. So I had the opportunity to start walking through those locations and uh, I never had an experience, but I could see where people were very uncomfortable at times walking through the houses or the ship, you know, 
and when it was down in the bowels of the ship or was, you know, late at night at the Winchester house, you definitely hear some really interesting things. So that got me enamored with the world of horror. And then I started watching more when more movies going back all the way to the fifties and, and became just enamored with watching, you know, movies in that particular genre. So that's where I've kind of ended up. (laughs) Oh, always. It was always fun to go through and, experience that kind of i got actually really fascinated with actually interviewing people um as we were developing winchester with people who actually had experiences at the house um or at the ship and uh, i think people like one of our financers who financed the actual winchester movie said that he went when he was i think like 10 or 11 years old and he saw sarah winchester on a tour a lady dressed in black had a whole experience he said, listen, my body went completely uh, limp. Everything in the room was like freezing cold. And I, then I turned left and I saw a, he goes, it wasn't even a shadow figure. It was a woman in a black veil, um, you know, at the end staring at me and then scurried off, you know. And he goes, ever since I had that experience, I've been wanting to make a movie about the Winchester Mystery House. And this is a guy that, you know, has been a an executive at some of the top tier studios in the world, you know, not just one off the street telling you a story, you know. So this is a guy who's very, very cynical in life, you know, telling you I had an experience and this is real. So and it's those kind of experiences that I had doing Halloween events at the Winchester Mystery House where we would form Halloween events in the vein of like uh, Not Scary Farm or Halloween Horror Nights or whatever. And we would have constant occurrences of actors who were put in the house having paranormal, um, I would say, sounds come their way or even shadow figures or even objects moving by themselves. And they would quit on us within a moment's notice of going, I had experience. I'm not going back and thank you very much for, for employing me, but I am no longer working here. <laughs> yeah. It's quite a concept, you know, going to doing a haunted house at a haunted location. You know, it's almost like you're asking for it, you know, at the queen Mary, it's funny because, um, in the past they've had, um, paranormal tours go through and, and even investigators. And at times, um, the homeless in long beach would sneak on the queen Mary and would go and hide in corners of the ship. And they, you know, people would actually encounter these people. And they said, Oh my God, I would hear paranormal sounds and then turn a corner. And some guy would come out of nowhere, scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> that was just trying to get warm in the corner of the ship. And I'm like, Oh my God, die of a heart out. I mean, I, I was really, blown away with with helen mirren you know and just what a professional was in in how she conducted herself and also how her performance went with winchester i thought she had done a really really great job um you know every movie is you know with tons and tons of challenges as you know going through filmmaking and especially when you know you're going through covid and and just fighting to try to make a movie. It's almost like entering a war in a way <laughs> of who's to survive at the end of this. And, uh, you know, I, I really don't have a favorite one way or another as a producer. I'm just kind of one of those people that looks and sees all the imperfections and kind of go, Oh my God, we could have done this better, but this is what went wrong, you know? And I think that's the, uh, the, the hard part with, um, you know, with the audiences, they don't really know all the the tales of horror that went on to make a movie <laughs> at times, especially in the last three years where, you know, we were laughing um, the other day about how, you know, there were days that we went without grips on the film, you know, or without lighting technicians or at times where Netflix would poach some of our department heads in the middle of the movie to go and work for them, you know, and we'd be down a department head, you know, it's just like these things that you, you don't hope to see on screen, you know? So for me, it's, I think everyone in a way is kind of a favorite, <laughs> a favorite because we got it in the can and, you know, and quite frankly, we tried to tell the best story we could given what we were given in such a, limited time frame so i think everything is really kind of accomplishment but i'm a perfectionist so i always see the flaw you know so 
Uh, the location came to us. We worked with a great individual at the Queen Mary at the time named Steve Sheldon, who was responsible for all the entertainment events at the Queen Mary. He was the director at that time. And uh, I pursued wanting to basically acquire the rights to film on the ship and use the trademarks and the stories. And uh, sure enough, you know, after God, years, probably four years of working with the city of Long Beach, we finally reached an agreement to do a movie, you know, so it was a very, very long legal process. And then process began of writing the script, you know, and uh, that's always a challenge in itself. And then you take the next step of finding the director <laughs> and then the director wants to change everything <laughs> usually, you know, so uh, it's always a fun creative process, but you know, that's really how it went. So this has been almost a decade in the making. So, and nothing is ever easy in filmmaking. So it's to be expected. I, I thought it was just me at a time that, oh my God, only my movies take 10 years. But uh, after listening to Steven Spielberg talk about how long it took him to make a film about one of the greatest presidents, you know, in the United States history with Abraham Lincoln, with um, Liam Easton, you know, um, who was attached to that role before he bowed out because of taken success, you know, and he goes, it took him over 10 years to make that movie, you know, and just goes to show you, you know, how hard filmmaking is to get something made. Yeah. We were so. able to work with Steve Sheldon at the queen Mary, who had a ton of knowledge about all the different, different myths and legends because he was responsible for dark Harbor. That is a famous event at the queen Mary and all the legends from Jackie to lady in white. And then we worked with one of the Commodores, Everett Horde, who has been there for many years. And then John Thomas, who's the historian. And we tried to come up with a story that, in a way, told all the different, you know, um, myths and legends of the Queen Mary. Like I just mentioned, um, the little girl with the footprints, the the idea of the lady in white. I think one of the ones that really fascinated me and really was the cause and main central character of the film was the myth around the pool being a portal to the other side, you know, was, was what everyone really talks about. And I thought, well, Hey, if we could take that aspect and channel into something bigger, which was the item that fascinated me with getting the rights was, the Titanic really wasn't the sinkable, the unsinkable ship that everyone said it was with the White Star Line. It actually was the Queen Mary, the sister ship. Because if you look at through the whole term of her sailing um, the ocean, you saw everything from uh, Hitler putting out a a reward for sinking the ship. You saw a rogue tidal wave that basically hit it, the ship on its side and capsized it. And that was the whole story of the Poseidon adventure that came about. And of course, the Queen Mary was able to come back up. Um, you have everything from um, the Curacao accident where the Queen Mary hit the Curacao in the middle of the ship and that could have sunk it. And then you look recently to all the bankruptcies that the Queen Mary has basically <laughs> survived where it could have become scrap metal. Um, it really was the unsinkable ship at the end of the day. So um, even now, when you see the the fight the city of Long Beach has had with trying to restore it and and not give up on it, so uh, I thought that was fascinating and uh, was worth telling. Yeah, it's really a fascinating. Even like what a lot of people don't realize is that the Queen Mary was you know, the next um, ship in line. And during the Great Depression, when it was being built, everything stopped. So um, they did not continue building the Queen Mary. And those shipyard towns, you know, at that Great Depression time were, you know, they were starving. You know, this was what kept the town alive. And uh, it really was the British government who came to Cunard and came to White Star Line and said, listen, we don't want you guys competing against each other. We want you guys to merge together to become Canard White Star. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why the English government agreed to finish the financing on the Queen Mary is because those two companies merged. So um, that was very fascinating. And I also thought that that could play a role in the, um, the mythos of 
the Queen Mary as, okay, what happened, you know, with the ship and its building, um, which we got into something very, very clever, which was, I'm not sure you're familiar with this, foundational sacrifices that go all the way back to the time of the Egyptians. And, and it was, you know, plays a really tremendous part in the Queen Mary and explains why the pool is the portal and why the ship is actually unsinkable. So that was kind of our fiction that then lays into, you know, whether you not whether you want to believe fiction or fact to the idea of Lady and White and Jackie and having these all interplay um, as we go through our 1938 timeline. Yeah, I mean, we tried to incorporate as much as we could. You know, that made sense. It didn't take people too off track, but it was very much you're trying to get the idea of, you know, whether you want to call her Jackie with the white footprints being seen all throughout the ship, you know, um, whether or not you, you know, you wanted to go and, and encompass Fedora Man, which is a, a great myth, you know, on the ship. And then also talking about some of the military members that were um, from, um, various German vessels that were prisoner of war that would come over, you know, from the transatlantic crossings of the Queen Mary and and relive the Curacao sinking. So all of that plays into a very, very cool storyline where all these concepts are are married together into our timeline. So, you know, as much as we can, even what happens in whatever you want to call it, you know, um, the, the notorious stateroom where a murder was supposedly taking place, you know? So we try to get as many stories and, and little winks and Easter eggs to Queen Mary fans as much as we can. I mean, realistically, you know, it took us about got 18 months. It was a very, very long process because there was a lot of started stops, not only because of COVID, but then um, going and having to get COVID insurance and going through new COVID protocols to make sure all the cast and crew were safe. Um, then you're filming it in two different countries, the U S and, <laughs> and the, uh, the UK. And then as you know, with being Mary, you know, the ship was vacant for now almost two years. So there were safety concerns there. There were issues with the actors being able to come over here with a visa, a travel visa with COVID with various countries. Um, so whether it be the UK or Ireland, um, then you even had production issues over in the U um, the UK of whether or not, you know, you had gas to get crew to the, <laughs> the actual filming stations because the UK would run out of gas at times, you know, then you would have issues where, you know, we have water scenes, but you couldn't heat the water or put child actors in it, you know, and then, you know, then you run into problems also where you're thinking you have 350 visual effects shots and, and the director has changed it seven or 800. So, um, you know, he's trying to make it most, the most authentic movie that you can see and, and, and trying to elevate the quality of the film he's, he's trying to produce. So a lot of, a lot of hiccups along the way, but, uh, you know, we're happy that it's done and the quality is definitely there where I think you're going to have a very hard time telling what was filmed on the ship and what was filmed in the UK. You know what? We wanted to pick a very, very strong female lead because she's kind of the driver of our film, you know? So, um, I know our director was a, a big fan of Alice Eve, you know, who has always had, um, some great success at being the leading lady, you know, whether it's for Star Trek or even um, the downtown Abbey uh, spinoff that she was just recently in. Um, she always comes across as really commanding um, presence. And then we were lucky enough to work with Joel Fry, who just came off of Corella um, and that success with Emma Stone. And, uh, you know, he's just a fantastic actor and, uh, and played really, really well with, with Alice. And then we found some great diamonds in the rough with uh, Lenny Rush, who just won a BAFTA and, um, and Will Coben, who is in um, boys in the boat for George Clooney. That's coming out, um, you know, just some real, you know, um, talented actors. And we even were very fortunate to work with a gentleman that we found 
and discovered actually at Disney um, named Wesley Alfin. And he is actually the first person that I just learned the other day to actually portray Fred Astaire in a TV or movie. Um, so, and just watching him act and then plan the choreography and dance the role um, in the grand ballroom of the Queen Mary. It really kind of feels and took you back that you were actually in the ballroom in 1938 watching this happen as a guest just having dinner. So um, it's nice to kind of watch these act actors transport you because Gary's wish in, in this casting was to find a really talented group, you know, that could... Um, intertwine the two family stories the ones in 1938 and the the cast in 2023 and interweave them in a way that it felt very much like the shining on a ship you know what i have to give it to to gary that gary told me he goes listen i i'm not trying to knock anybody's work you know but he goes i'm not trying to tell a conjuring type story where we're trying to count the jump scares you know through the film where Every studio executive that's in a horror, I guess, buying position for their studio, they all, hey, it's not a horror film if we don't have 35 jump scares, you know, and Gary's attitude was, well, then we would never have gotten such great classics as The Shining, you know, <laughs> um, you know, in some of these films in the 60s, 70s and 80s. He goes, I'm more concerned of having a creepy vibe all the way through and it's okay if the film is somewhat confusing, you know, he goes, the shining was confusing, you know, not everybody got it, you know, um, he goes, it was just unbelievable performances and the imagery was stunning, you know, and it left people walking away, not knowing all the answers and wanting to go and see it a second, a third time. So I think Gary really accomplished that, you know, and making a film, look like we had a much bigger studio hundred million dollar budget than we did <laughs> so yeah it's, it's really a shame nowadays because i run into so many studio heads and you see things like midsummer and midsummer didn't have a lot of you know jump scares didn't make it any less of a scary film i mean even barbarian if you really look at barbarian it had four or five good scares but it wasn't um the typical new line cinema Let's do 40 jump scares or it's not a horror film, you know? Uh, so I really, I really wish that studios would look at horror films a little bit differently nowadays, you know, try to get an array of horror than just going for the obvious, you know? And that's what we kind of experienced a little bit with Winchester because um, Winchester skewed a little bit older in demographic where you were getting late twenties and thirties to go see it, you know, because, Helen Mirren was in it, but, but also it didn't, you know, get you having, a, it didn't <laughs> require you having a heart attack every two seconds, you know, where there just was no pacing. It was really just a scare. Count, and listen, we tried know? to go, I, I'm a big practical guy. So if I can go practical over special effects, I usually will, you know, because listen, uh, I, every time I do interviews, I, I try to shoot everybody straight. It, we're not a James Cameron, $500 million movie, you know? So you're in the horror space you have a limited budget so you got to exercise what you can on it so uh, for us our special effects were making the queen mary look like it was at sea so when you see the opening shot and it's at sea it looks i mean beautiful it looks realistic i mean and that's where we really spent our money is the set extensions and the ship at sea because if we couldn't go and sell the 1938 with the ship still in operation we weren't going to be able to sell you this story um but we did try to do as many um you know stunts where alice at one point is holding off of a, a door frame for one of the the as you probably saw in the trailer where she's suspended above ocean you know and we built the door frame and put the green screen under her and did that all practical you know um so we tried to do as much practical as we could um and even really the visual effects that we did do that were really mind-boggling where we actually went to a visual effects stage the same one that was used for the mandalorian where we had a virtual production where we were able to scan sections of the queen mary that we were a little bit concerned that if we were to film in those sections we would damage the ship and we didn't want to do that to a 
single vessel. So we would actually film with a very small crew of six to eight in the actual ship, let's say the grand ballroom, where we had fireworks going off and everything else, and we would scan that section and then rebuild it as a 360 virtual set and then lay the actual floor and the tables in the center. And the camera, when it tracked, obviously the positioning of the uh, the background would move with the camera. So it kept you in that same perspective, you know, and it's amazing uh, what technology can do. So if, if there's anything that should be commended, it was probably the virtual production aspect of it, you know, that we had while working in the UK. So that's what we try to do is, is be as authentic as we could, because, uh, the last thing we want to do is offer any kind of disservice to the Queen Mary fans, you know, that are going to go and love this film and probably make it a cult hit through the years. (laughs) Well, I'm hoping with, uh, you know, I guess the strike and everything else, there's not going to be a lot of content out. So hopefully people experience it and, and hopefully like it. So. Yes, it'll be August 18th, which is Friday of next week, and it will be available uh, at certain theaters. Um, I don't know which ones yet, but it will have a domestic release. I know it's going to be released in every country internationally in theaters, and then it'll also be domestically on VOD on Apple, Amazon, etc., starting on that same date, August 18th.